just one of the master teachers and host scheme of our time, Rabbi Dr. Alan Uter, who's a highly respected American Orthodox rabbi who went on Aliyah and moved to Eretz Yisrael, to Medina Yisrael with his wonderful wife upon his retirement, having served in Rabbanus as an educator and a pulpit rabbi for many decades, live in the holy city of Yerushalayim there in Jerusalem. He has elevated the holy city to a new heights. Who, who knew it could go to new heights even? Rav Yudar is involved in many things. He teaches at Torah Riva right now. And he is someone I always look to for um, Talmudic wisdom, for uh, halachic guidance, someone who is, uh, who is both deeply committed uh, to the Mesora and also who is um, uh, uh, fierce in his defense of what is true and what is good and just. So Rav Yudar is going to teach us a class today on the introduction to Ig Igros Moshe, Igros Moshe, of the teaching of the greatest posik, perhaps the greatest posik of the 20th century in America, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Rabbi Yudar, welcome. Thank you, Rav Shpulzik. My ears are still burning from your introduction. <laughs> I just do my best. <laughs> Half the shear will be devoted to Rabbi Feinstein's introduction to his own set of works, because that uh, reveals to us how he wants us to see his pisakim, his decisions. And then I'm going to do a rapid survey of his various opinions, like a literary critic. What is his oeuvre? What does he really believe based on an empirical read of his literary work? He opens by saying, in, in my book, most of which are answers to questions that I answered to people who asked my opinion, I tried the best that I could to come to learning and make decisions. And I don't fall into the trap of many rabbis. Many rabbis don't want to answer questions. They're afraid they'll get it wrong. And a person who is not worthy of making halachic decisions, who makes halachic decisions, causes great harm. Many rabbis have fallen by making Pesach halacha and not knowing how. But worse than that is if you're able to make Pesach halacha and you refuse to do so, or it's like when God was confronting Moses and God said, Moses says to God, please, Mr. God, I'm like... I don't want to go. I'm like Mr. Custer. I don't want to go. I want to, I want to stay with the sheep. So you got to go because that's what we need. You have to answer the question because someone has to do it. When there's no one qualified, become she'en ish, a herring is a fish. Now, in the introduction to Rabbi Akiva Eger's tshuva, his son wrote, the situation is that one has to be able and not fear of modesty to refuse to take questions. You got to answer. Rabbi Feinstein is ask, answering the question. If we are such a rundown generation, how can we dare answer? The answer is someone's got to do it. Someone got to take out the trash. Someone has to get their hands dirty. And to get their hands dirty, you can't live in a rarefied platonic world, but a real world. Now, what is this real world? In any case, as long as the, the true... The Poseg tries hard, he will rule according to the true law. What is the true law? For my opinion, the true law is the norm encountered and encoded in the oral Torah library that ends with, according to Maimonides, with Ravina the first and Ravashi around 425, or in Bava Metzia, page 86, we're told, Ravina and Ravashi say for Ra'a. That's the end of the oral Torah development. As long as you poskin within that framework, you're okay, according to the Rambam, because we are, our Torah is not in heaven. Now, according to Rabbi Feinstein, this authority is given to Gedole Hador. He writes, There are Different generations will have different criteria for who's a great one. Shmuel Badoro, Kiyiftach Badoro. Jephthah came first, and Shmuel came second, and each was the Gadol of their generation. Ironically, that puts to the lie the doctrine of Yeridas Adoros, because from, from Yiftach 
to Shmuel, that could be our host, as well as Shmuel Hanavi. We've gotten better since Yiftah, but we won't, we'll talk about that a little later, perhaps. The disciples of the generation are the only worthy disciples, because only they being part of the generation, they rule for the generation. But you can't let everyone have an opinion. Not everyone is worthy of an opinion. And he says it is not possible or permissible due to Yeridat Tadorot for later generations who have this title, office, and franchise. The category of Higiyah Lahura, reaching the ability to teach Halacha, was proclaimed. I bear with me one second, please. The ability to, to, to offer these apartments is circular. Rabbi Akiva Ayer says that's the rule. He doesn't prove it. Now, the, Rabbi Feinstein continues. The, the judge has to know before whom they are judging, the litigants, and before whom, with a capital W and a small W, before God and the litigants, he has to be responsible. Now, some would might want to say, why do I have to involve myself with this pain in the neck of making Pesachalocha? Rashi tells us when we, that you shouldn't worry about if you make a mistake, you'll be punished. But the, the, the Torah says that the law is given imachem, with you in the plural, the judges. The judge can only see with his own eyes. That's, you, got, you have your eyes, your filter. And that filter determines how you see the world. And God's Torah is seen through your words, through your eyes. And the halacha accepts that decision. That the, that the, the posse can only do what he's able to do. Now, how does the posse get this power? Gemara in Menachot, page 29, says, that when Moses was taken up to heaven and sh sitting in the back of the yeshiva Shomala, and Rabbi Akiva was teaching Torah, he was connecting the dot, the crowns to the letters, the Shatnez God's letters, the letters that have the crowns. And he said, what's that? And uh, he says, listen in, listen in. And Rabbi Akiva is saying a shir in Torah Shemal Peh. And Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't have the foggiest idea What's going on? Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't understand Rabbi Akiva Shir. And then when the students were pressing Rabbi Akiva, how do you know that? And Rabbi Akiva said, it's a halacha la Moshe Misenai. And Moshe says to the Abishter, I didn't say that. I said, oh, but, yes, but God said, but yes, you did. Dor, 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 eshav, dor, dor, manhigav. Every generation has their leaders who are part of their generation. Rev. Moshe Mokain, who I call him Marcel Foucault, Ma Moshe Mokain. He says everyone is necessarily part of their time horizon. You can't get out of your time horizon. Rambam was also a medieval man as great as he was. Everyone is part of their generation. That means in his time, Dr. Seuss was not a racist, and I'm not horsing around. Now, in, in other words, Moshe Feinstein is saying, Jewish law is indeterminate. It's not, it's indeterminate. In an article by Gabriel Bechhofer, he also says, according to this system of halacha, the law is indeterminate and given to Gedolei Hador to interpret. Now that's rather radical, but that's what they say. The post now becomes a virtual oracle. God defers to the intuition of the great sage. How does it work that God defers to the intuition of the great, great sage? Bava Metziah 59b. The law says, the letter of the law says that a kli, a utensil that's shattered and that shat, it, and to the point where the shards have no value, that those shards don't have tumah. That was said by Rabbi Eliezer Hagodel, 
He was a Godel Hador. That's why they called him Rabbi Eliezer Hagodel. And this Rabbi Eliezer Hagodel had a great memory. Remember in Turkey Avos, we say he is Borsid, a sealed sister. Doesn't lose a drop of water. His memory is great. And he is right, because that's what the Mishnayas and Taharos say. However, the Torah says, V'yosisu al-piyat Torah asher yarucha. You have to behave and practice according to the Torah that they, that Sanhedrin, will teach you. And if they tell you that left is right and right is left, you better get a compass, because you got to follow what they tell you to do. Now, the posek, being a virtual oracle, has great discretion. But that is only for the Supreme Court of Israel, the Beit Din Hagodol. Rambam says this, that authority ends with, with, with Ravina and Ravashi, based on Bava Metzia B6. But Ramosha says it applies even in our time today. Ramosha makes a maximalist claim that the, that the entire Torah was given at Sinai Bi Sinai. However, a close reading would give offer a different interpretation. When it says Moshe Kibil Torah Mi Sinai, it doesn't say Moshe Kibil Eta Torah, referring to the Torah book, but refers to a Torah without the definite article. That means it's a different kind of Torah, not the five books that Moses got but an oral Torah, not the written Torah. The notion of Torah, me Sinai, is from the moment of Sinai onward. Not that the whole package was delivered at Mount Sinai, but the authority for the package is not this Sinai. Forgive me, because that's not what the Mishnah says in Pekayavos. It's me Sinai onward. If you don't believe that, you wouldn't have the book of Bemidbar, which happened after Sinai. And the Israelites would have known better than to, to mess up the plague narrative, the, 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 the spy narrative. The human petin the human petin has the authority, according to the system, to interpret the law, the oraita. What is Torah law? And the question is asked. We we're, told, we're told that God is restrained in, in the Pesach process. What does that mean? And Ramosha says, how, what, how do we restrain God? And the answer is, according to the law, we have to look and see that the the Jewish people's courts are authorized to make their rulings. The indeterminacy of the law means human discretion is part of the law. The great sage applies his divinely inspired intuition to understand and apply God's word and will. Maimonides assigns this power to the Beit Din Agadol. Rabbi Feinstein assigns this power to the Gedolim, the great sage. That means sometimes the great sages will subtly overrule Talmudic law. We're going to study some of that. The mortal rabbi must be obeyed, even if he does not read God's mind correctly. They're doing their best. That's all they have to do. You can't do better than your best. But they are the ones who must be obeyed according to Rav Moshe's system. Now, how does this work in everyday life? I'm now going to do a rapid reading survey of Rabbi Feinstein's Pesachim. First, his range of pluralism. According to Rabbi Feinstein, non-Orthodox non-compliance to the letter of the law, norm or statute is as follows. Jewish laws are norms, statutes, positive acts of legislation. You got to obey them. Today, people don't obey them. We have to forgive them. They know not what they do. However, the, the, their clergy are heretics. Don't answer their barachot. 
They misrepresent Torah and compete with us, the Frim rabbis, as teachers of Torah. They are the enemy. I am, I am summarizing Rabbi Feinstein's view. On one hand, I have to respect it and give it its due. I come from a different place. So do not assume that I will consent to everything said here. I'm having to try to explain Rabbi Feinstein. Rabbi Feinstein says they misrepresent Torah. They deny our sages and they compete with us as teachers of Torah. Now, what are these deviations that we do in the Orthodox world? We dance and clap on Shabbos and Yom Tov. Well, some do, I don't, because the law says not to do it. From the way Rabbi Feinstein handles this, I have tremendous respect for him. The law says, Ein marakadin, vein You don't clap or slap your thighs or, or dance on Shabbat and Yom Tov. Everyone does it, or almost everyone. Everyone does it. You say it's lichus. Rabbi Feinstein will not criticize the Orthodox community. This is an acceptable sin. But he says, better not to do it. Better not to do it. Smoking cigarettes. The question was put to Rabbi Aaron by Rabbi Aaron Kirschenbaum. In 1969, he was my first teacher in codes at the JTS. He left, left the conservative movement, became a professor of law at Tel Aviv University. And he wrote a, the, one of the first major articles in Rabbi Feinstein's work. And he, he, he found that Rabbi Feinstein was a legal realist. Legal realism in the tradition of Oliver Wendell Holmes. You have to deal with real life. You can't dismiss the community and what it does. He, he accepts orthodox deviation. Orthodox Jews smoke. Going to Jewish law, it says, you got to preserve your life. And smoking cigarettes is dangerous to your health. So how do you justify it? He says it's better not to smoke but he won't call out the people who smoke. He, he, one of his buddies on the Lower East Side was Rabbi Henkin. Rabbi Henkin approved of the Manhattan a route. He, Rabbi Feinstein did not. From a pure legal point of view, Rabbi Feinstein's a route is more kosher than Rabbi Henkin's a route. Because an a route has to be more enclosed than open. You need permission from every non-observant Jew and every Gentile within the perimeter to make an Erev kosher, according to the Pshat and Gemara and the Rambam. Halachos Gedolos, Rashi and Tosafot say, no, you, if you don't have 600,000 people in, in that Erev, it's not a Rishos Sarabim. However, that's not the Gemara's definition. That's Rabbi Jacob Tam's definition. So, the people who don't use the Arab on Shabbos, they're following Pshad. He won't criticize Rabbi Henkin, but he won't say Rabbi Henkin is right. He won't say the community is illegitimate or wrong if they clap and dance on Shabbos and Yom Tov. I learned a great rule for that. Sometimes the rabbi has to know when not to, not to talk. Sometimes we talk too much. We worry our God to death. Why? Because we speak irresponsibly. And sometimes it's better, less is, less is more. He won't criticize the community. Rabbi Feinstein says sheer in Yiddish at Mesif the Torah of Yerushalayim. Why didn't he speak Lashon HaKodesh? It says in Sifre 46, because the Pasuk says, speak in those words. If you want to be a, why are you speaking Yiddish? There's, there's no halacha to speak in Yiddish. Is that Masorah tradition? It is if your culture is called Yiddishkeit. We're not necessarily imposing the law. He forbids, however, board of rabbi membership because that gives recognition to the non-Orthodox. 
You may not work for or be hired by a non-Orthodox institution. My Rebbe, Chacham Yosef Faor Zatzal, taught, taught at JTS, he taught me. He's the guy who taught me enough to, to get pulled out of there because the halacha wasn't being observed. Rabbi Feinstein had a rule on the question, can Rabbi Faor teach in the Sephardic Orthodox community of Brooklyn? And he said, no. Now, that's a whole nother speech, you know, a whole nother issue. But the fact is Rabbi Feinstein's policy is we have to have strict, clear, unambiguous boundaries. So if you work for or hired by a non-Orthodox institution, you're guilty of a, by association. In his essay, his teshuva on transistor microphones, on Shabbos and Yom Tov, he forbids them. His answer is because the gedolim say so and they made their, their ruling and they have to be obeyed. Is that the oral Torah's law? Yeah, that because the gedolim have ruled, you, you have to listen to the gedolim? Well, there's a God called Kodesh Baruch Hu, who gave a Torah with an oral Torah that says, you don't shave with a razor blade. There are people who don't know that. And therefore, they're not possible to aid us if they don't know that. And if you bury the dead on the first day of Yom Tov, because you think it's allowed by Gentile, or on the second day of Yom Tov, if it's done by Jews, it's a problem. According to Rabbi Feinstein, you don't bury the dead on the second day of Yom Tov by Gentile, because we'll go, Goyim will make us do the work. Uh, that's not what the original law was. Rabbi Feinstein wants clarity and boundaries and is willing to tolerate certain levels of deviation. However, he accepted Rabbi Edward Gershfield of Blessed Memories get. He was a professor of law and Talmud at JTS. And he, Rabbi, he, he had, he, he, his get was approved of by Rabbi Moshe. Rabbi Moshe knows what the letter of the law is. And he, just as he reminds us, he reminds us that he won't criticize the clapping and dancing on Shabbos. And he will not criticize the, he, 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 he will not criticize the, the smoking on, on weekdays because of health reasons. But he will not pull, he will not lie to himself. He this is a remarkable sense of honesty. He speaks in a code and that a, that a scholar will pick up. And that shows a greatness that I, I have seen no, nowhere else. Rabbi Feinstein also permits women wearing wigs on Shabbos. Now, there's a problem because the Gemara in Shabbos, in page 64, side B, says wigs are not kosher head coverings. And if you don't believe me, I give the footnote to Rabbi Mordechai, Rabbi Avadi Yosef, who tells us that it's a wrong thing to do in very uncertain terms. Rabbi Feinstein believes that great rabbi's policy must be obeyed for communal cohesion, but he has the integrity not to disrupt that cohesion by demanding habla, hobgoblin of little minds consistency. He knows, believes, and accepts the difference between law and policy, and the close reader will pick it up, or at least after it's called to our attention. In other words, he is very smart, exquisitely and piously sincere, and also socially street smart. He applies the method of study. The if we apply the method of studying the rules of the unreliable narrator in literature, the narrator tells a story, tells a narrative, and is revealing things about themselves that they would should have been hiding, but that bleeds through. And Rabbi Feinstein's Torah that bleeds through. He recognizes the sincerity of those with whom he disagrees and will not dishonor them, but miss his private identity for what he believes to be the letter of the law. The letter of the law for me, Uter, is the law. And we have the possibility because of Hora Acha'a to make discretionary adjustments. 
Rabbi Feinstein believes that authority should be given to the Godel Hador Bilvad. Rambam and Mamrim chapter two, paragraph four, disagrees. It's given to any local rabb. On Pesant, Rabbi Feinstein's piety bleeds through in spite of his best efforts to suppress it. He doesn't want to be a big shot. He doesn't, he says, if you want to know my opinion, I'll tell you my opinion. He's not pushing himself on the community. The people could like the, the way he answered questions. For the rank and file rabbis, authority resides in the charisma of the great rabbi Gavra, a person, than the chetzer, the object of the sacred text. Now, on women and gender issues, he was very, very well received, but very controversial. His famous teshuva is Orachayim, volume four, paragraph 40, chapter 49. He says at the beginning, we cannot change our laws at all. Does he really believe that? We'll see. Feminism he sees as a challenge to all hierarchical authority. And that's amazing, because I don't believe Rabbi Feinstein audited classes at the New York City New School of Social Thought and Critical Theory. I don't think he did that. Rabbi Moshe's yeshiva was under the shadow in the Lower East Side of the Forvitz. You know what the word Forvitz means in English? Forward. That's what we call today progressive. Pre Vice President Kamala Harris is a progressive. She would follow, read, if she read Yiddish, she would read the Forvitz. This is a, an amazing thing. Rabbi Feinstein is aware of these challenges. Women may accept the Tosafot leniency to say a bracha on time-bound mitzvahs. Your woman is allowed to say, Asher Kedeshanam Mitzvotav Etzivanu Likro Oligmore Tahalel or Al Natilas Lulav. That's not what the Gemara says. If you're not commanded to do a mitzvah, you can't say the mitzvah bracha. Why when we do a conversion, we have the bracha after the tefillah? Because when they're not Jewish, they can't say, I share Kiddush on a mitzvah tab. They're not commanded yet until they cut up for the mikvah. They're, they're commanded. However, Rav Moshe Feinstein wants the old time ways to remain the old time ways. Are women allowed to wear talus tefillin and do shechita? According to the Rambam in Hilchos Tzitzit, chapter three, paragraph nine, a woman can do talus and lulav mitzvahs and say the bracha on neither. Rabbi Feinstein follows the Ramah. And the Ramah says, women may not do talus because of Yehorah, it's a sign of arrogance. But a woman may, may make a bracha on lulav. She may make a bracha on lulav because Tosvot says so. Rashi did not. Rashi law was ein mevarachin al haminah. You can't make a bracha on a minah because it's not a mitzvah. We don't say asher kedushanu b'mitzvotenu. You get kedusha from doing mitzvahs. We say in Kriyashma. You see that it says uritemoto uzechartem at mitzvah mitzvot Hashem v'yitem kedoshim lelokeichem. You'll be holy to your God. When you make a bracha, you say asher kedushanu b'mitzvot tov. And in the Amidah, we say kadushenu. Not the minhagenu, but the mitzvotecha. So Tosafot doesn't want women to wear talus. Then we say women can't wear tefillin because of gufnaki. They can't keep their bodies clean. Well, if they're menopause, they can. And the Gemara never said that. The, the medieval rabbis said that. Is that binding or is that changeable? Well, they made a change. Can we change it back? Rav Moshe would say no. Are women allowed to do shechita? According to the Gemara, the Mishnah, women can do shechita. And according to the Rabbi, we call Tilchos Eretz Yisrael, 
Women do not do shrita because it's they'll, they'll, they'll faint. We don't want women to do shrita. We don't want women to be public beings. The Gemara doesn't always say that. Take the case of the double ring ceremony. He opposes the double ring ceremony. Rabbi Falavechik wrote about, spoke about this. It's, he says it looks like the bride is rejecting the ring. It violates culture tradition. However, what this says in Shulchan Aruch, Af al pi shechazru, betoch hamekadesh et ha'isha, vechazar miyad. A man gives a kedushin to the woman. She accepts it. And, it can, and, she, and she gives it back in, in an instant. She remains mekudesha. So according to the Shulchan Aruch, in Evan Ha'ezer, chapter 38, paragraph 34, there would be no problem in a double ring ceremony. The real issue is don't mess with culture tradition. Misora, they say. Now, my view is if we do not permit what is permitted, we're not going to be trusted to forbid the forbidden. And then we come to the issue of men and women shaking hands. Ramosha says it's hard to permit it. Why doesn't he say it's forbidden? He doesn't say it's forbidden because, gentlemen and ladies, it's not. If you look closely at Reb Moshe's words, Reb Moshe says it's hard to permit gender, intergender shaking of hands. He realizes there is no violation, but the Nagia taboo has been accepted and taught as the culture standard. What's happening here? Jacob Neusner, in his book on the mission, explains, women were seen as a source of sin, pollution, and danger. This does not make their rulings not law. Men writing like men in their culture horizon, like Plato, Aristotle, and Sam I am Dr. Seuss, all like ourselves, are products of our world. Like Noah was a product of his world. And in the world that we inhabit, intergender contact in the secular world is acceptable. And in the Haredi culture, it is not. Those are facts. So and he observed that some Orthodox rabbis do shake hands with women. Rabbi Feinstein realizes there's no violation. The Negea taboo is still part of his culture. Now, where do I come off saying all this nonsense? I'll be writing a different paper on this shortly. Jacob kissed Rachel when he saw it was a cousin. For that sin, she would have been kicked out of Beis Yaakov. Shmuel, the, 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 the Amora says, intergender contact, if innocent, if done l'shem shemaim, is mutter. Rav Ocha danced with a woman on his shoulders in Ksuba 17, side A. They, that, she wasn't doing a waltz. On the shoulders, noch better. Innocent touching of a non-spouse nida was never forbidden in the oral Torah canonical library. Lo dubim velo yar. It ain't there. That's not the way we practice. But you won't find the data. In the Gemara up to Rabin and Ravashe, there is no isur on a non-appetitive, libido-driven contact. And the Rambam says this as well. The Rambam says this in Isurei B, page tw chapter 21. If you have the contact, l'shem ta'ava, to satisfy your urges, that's usur, doraita, physical contact. And gesture, non-physical contact, is called usur de rabonin. Lalacha is moral, but not obsessive. We've added the obsessiveness in our current world. Now, what about women doing the mitzvahs? Let's go back. The commissioner says, Hakol shochatin, including women. The Rama says, slaughterers are leaders. Women may not lead, ergo, women may not slaughter. And we have a right to change the law. We have the right to change the law because the law would permit women to do shrita. And we're not going to allow it. So we can change the law in one direction. Based on the, 
on Devarim 17:15. Som Tasim Alecha Melech, you shall appoint a, a king. Now, that can be understood by a Bravanel as you may make a king. And the Rambam sees it admits that you must make a king. And from that, the, the, the Sifre derives that a woman may not be appointed king or leader. The tradition of the oral Torah, however, is forbidden. My question is, if we don't enforce Sifre 46, that requires speaking in Lashon HaKodesh, why do you insist on enforcing Shantasim Alecha Melech, the Lomaka, that you make a king, you can make a, a male king, but not a woman queen? Did you ever hear of a lady called Shalom Sion HaMalka? She became monarch, head of state, when her husband, Alexander Yanai, died. And to the notion of the Shah, who said, we never saw women do shrita, we say, lo ra'inu eno ra'aya. If you didn't see it, it's not enough to say it's forbidden. We have to have legislation that it's forbidden. The law says appoint a king. And the Goro is, is being divinely inspired, questions the sources, is questioning his sources, is a question of the dog Godel's greatness, intuition, office, and ability to read God's mind. What does the Torah say about that claim that the Godel is able to read God's mind and contradict the text of the words? Well, it says, King, Sh King Solomon says in Mishlei chapter 21, verse 30, against God's honor, we don't play games. And that means when the rabbi gets it wrong, you got to call out the rabbi. We're not perfect. And God himself says in Vayikra, chapter 4, verse 13, call Adat Yisrael Yishku. If the entire congregation of Israel, that could be the Sanhedrin, it could be the people, they all make a mistake. Then the Elam Devarme Neha Kahal. And something is lost before the eyes of the congregation. You get it wrong. Can everybody get it wrong? You bet. I've already noted that in Rambam and Hilchos, Tzitzit and Lulav. Rambam says, women may do Lulav and Tzitzit with a commanded bracha for neither, because he's not commanded. But does the Rabbi Feinstein always follow the Ramah? The Ramah says you don't need to eat lot meat. And Rabbi Feinstein supports eating lot meat. The Ramah says men don't have to wear a head covering all the time. And the Ramah is lenient on that. And they don't teach that in yeshivas. At least not the ones that I'm associated with. They got annoyed at me that I called attention to this Ramah. We follow the Ramah. Let the people know what they're buying into. Where the Ramah is lenient. Now, I have a problem with the Israeli rabbinate here. Because they say I shouldn't wear tzilin and chalamoi. And I think they're wrong. A, the Ramah says you wear tzilin and chalamoi. Why does he say that? Because he's a troublemaker, God forbid? Nay. You're allowed to write tzilin and chalamoi because you have an obligation to wear them. If a chassid doesn't want to wear tzilin, let him gain, let him go. Because you, you can't fight these battles, but you can't coerce a believing Jew not to do what they believe is a mitzvah. That's why you have to leave people alone. We have here now enough information to connect the dots. Rabbi Feinstein's leadership instinct is to preserve Yiddishkeit for the Yidin, the good Jews. We accept, the, we accomplish this goal. We have to allow some acceptable sin. What I've learned from Rabbi Moshe is the rabbis have to know when not to make issues. According to the Gemara, a woman has a right to observe male rights, like leaning on the sacrificial animal, smicha. We have the principle, gadol mitzuvevi oseh, misha'eno mitzuvevi oseh. The person who is commanded gets more zichut, but the non-commanded person gets zichut anyway. That means the law never allowed, disallowed it. Ramah and Rabbi Feinstein's outlawing about Woman's right is a change in the Messorah. 
And we were told that the Masorah can't be changed. You can't have it both ways. Responding to this conundrum, Rabbi Herschel Schechter of Yeshiva University says, Jewish law does change. When done by the Orthodox, it is called chidush. When done by the non-Orthodox, it is called reform. In English, that means heads you win, tails you lose. And you, well, for God's opinion, you look at chapter 13 in Deuteronomy, verses one through six. One through six, I miswrote that. That if you have a, a Navi or a Cholem Chalamot says, don't obey the law, you stone them and not with whiskey because they misrepresent the law. There are certain things that don't change and there's certain things that do. Now Yiddishkeit means the culture of the Yidden, the way we were is the way we ought to be. Is that the opinion of the oral Torah? It says in Ksubis, 58, side B, a woman has the right to say, any nizona, the any osa. That means, Mr. Husband, I won't take your support. Don't expect me to wait on you. This is a liberated woman. A Talmida of Betty for Dan. Covenant halacha can change within her authorized parameters. But what are those parameters? Comes the issue of women studying oral Torah. The Rambam says, here he quotes the Rambam. Rabbi Feinstein quotes the Rambam. He was asked by Rabbi El Yisrael, the Philadelphia Rosh Yeshiva, an ideological follower of Lakewood's Rabbi Aaron Cutler, a staunch culture conservative. It says in Gemara Sota, page 20, side A, Kol A man who teaches his daughter Torah is teaching her how to make uh, sexual sins. However, if you look closely at this passage, that's not a law. It's a description. A norm is a law. Do this, do that. This is not a norm. It is a descriptive observation, not a law. The Rambam took it as a law. Who gives me the right to disagree with the Rambam? A, the Rambam. Because I have a right to argue what the text means. It says in Tosefta Brachos, chapter two, paragraph 12, women may learn Mishnah. Rabbi Feinstein chose in answering to Rabbi Sway not to cite that Tosefta. So Rabbi Feinstein does cite the Tosefta, which claims that women have no obligation to do Mikra Megillah, but they have not cite this Tosefta. When do we follow the Tosefta? Rabbi Feinstein allows women to wear wigs. He, Rabbi Tendler, his son-in-law and, and primary student, and my smasmi, he says the, the wig is the badge of the Orthodox woman. It is a social, ideological culture statement. I'm a fine from woman. I'm a member of the community. However, Gemara in Shabbos 64b says, and Rabbi Yovad Yosef says, this is not for Svardim versus Ashkenazim. The woman's wig is against Tamacha. For those of you who learned that Yeshiva Chova Veitora, you had a Rebbe there in Halacha called Rabbi Yaakov Lov, who before there was a YCT, he was my Chavrusa. And he would go ballistic on the women's wigs. Ballistic. And he's right. However, it's become part of Yiddish type culture. Rabbi Feinstein on principle will not disrupt from society. Rabbi Moshe says his Torah is pure. No outside influences upon him. What emerges from the connected dots of this position? Rabbi Moshe says abortion is akin to murder. However, that's not what it says in Shmos chapter 21 verse 23. A person who makes an accidental loss of child, of infanticide, does not go to an Ir Miklot, the city of refuge, but pays a fine. That's a fine answer to, to property. And Gemara in Arachim, page seven, side B, says, when a woman is to be executed, we abort her if she's pregnant, so, for, so she not undergo the shame 
of a post-mortem delivery. Her shame is grounds for abortion. That means if a woman gets pregnant and through bad behavior and she's embarrassed, can she have an abortion? According to the Gemola, Busha is grounds for abortion. I didn't say that. Now, we don't like to do that kind of logic because it, 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 it sounds Catholic. Huh, sounds Catholic. On Thanksgiving, he, Rabbi Moshe says we shouldn't be observing Thanksgiving, but it's not about a Zora. He says, no, you don't understand. There's a rule called Darkei Amori, non-Jewish ways. Darkei Amori is now a mega halacha. Rabbi Moshe is teaching us. We're from Yidin, we're Yidin. We don't follow sports or football. Rabbi Shlomo Avinir also says that. We have one loyalty. We are not Jewish Americans. We are Jews who happen to reside in America, who are Yidin, who live a culture called Yiddishkeit, not America of the sleazy good time. And he writes good time in Yiddish, in Yiddish. And if you watch, listen closely to Rav Moshe's syntax. He's thinking in Yiddish, not in Lashon HaKodesh. Now, this doctrine, the great rabbis must be respected by being obeyed, goes back to the previous century to Pius IX, Pio Nono. That means in Italian, Pius IX. But he said no to everything. He was the last pope to disallow modernity. And he believed that only the church authority has the right to narrative agata theology. This is when Das Torah was invented, Rabotai, Virotai. Das Torah and purple and fallibility are similar attitudes. Where does the Torah deal with Das Torah? In the book of the Midbar, in the book of Numbers, where Bilam is said to have Yodea dot Elyon. He can read God's mind. However, God didn't seem to agree with him based on that narrative. Rabbi Feinstein insists that traditional beliefs be taught in yeshiva. That's not a traditional view. We learn first Torah, then we learn theology. Torah tzibolanu Moshe, Moshe Kelas Yaakov. The Torah presents the narrative that embodies our national theology. You learn Shema Yisrael after you learn Torah tzibolanu Moshe. We find God revealed in the lines of the Torah, not in statements and creeds. We don't have an official creed. Rabbi Weiss is here teaching that we need catechesis. Catechesis. That's theology for lay people. And where did Rabbi Feinstein come from? He came from a place called Prujan in Catholic Poland. In Catholic Poland. Now, Rabbi Feinstein strongly disapproves and doesn't allow the burial of ashes for cremation. In the Catholic tradition, when Rabbi Feinstein was a youth in Poland, the Catholics said, you can't do cremation because you're denying Olam Haba. Now, last I checked, if a person is not keeping the law, they're not keeping Shabbos, family purity or Shabbos, do they get buried in a Jewish cemetery? Yes, maybe not next to the tzaddikim, but they get buried. Why is cremation worse than Bi'ilas Nidah? I don't know. But if you look at the pattern of Pesach, where Rabbi Feinstein is taking a marginal position within the halakhic tradition, that marginal position seems an awful lot like the Roman Catholic Church of that day. Just like Rashi, seems to write like a monocos, the monks. He glosses the Talmud and the Bible. However, his grandson, Rabbi Jacob Tam, functions like a scholastic using pilpul, using casuistry, dialectic. He does, also does not approve of the study of philosophy. Ramad did. If you don't believe me, look at the introduction of Ramad to Shulchan Aruch. He quotes the Rambam. Is it allowed to quote philosophy? I don't know. Gets you into trouble. Now, what is this legal philosophy? 
Max Weber says, we, look, we have leadership style of tradition, charisma, and reason. The modern Orthodox prefer reason. That's what the Rambam says. But, we, but others don't agree with the Rambam. Rabbi Soloveitchik in Halachic Man says, the Rambam was not a Halachic Man. This version of Judaism is pure law. That's not the way it should be, according to this view. Only the great rabbi ha controls the tradition because he has the charisma and others don't. The use of reason cannot work for people whose reason powers are too weak. Rabbinic authority of the Orthodox world. The official religion orthodoxy, the orthodoxy that, that the text says, the rabbi is told he makes psak, yore yore. And in the YU ordination, it says, magia lahora, you're able to make hora. But then we're told rabbi shouldn't make hora because it says we don't believe it. The local rav is the marda atra, the master within his jurisdiction. His ruling is valid if it's consistent with the Gemara of Ravina and Ravaje. The real religion of Rabbi or Rabbi Feinstein's Orthodox Street culture is something very different. The local rav is not really a marda atra. The gedolim are the real authority because they have the intuition, and we don't. The local rabbi's authority is apostolic. He's the sent one. Like the Chabad's shaluchim, the emissaries. The word shaluach in Greek would be apostle. Those who are sent. And they don't teach their Torah, they teach the Torah of their Rebbe. The Chassam Sofer in Hungary made the congregation rabbi an emissary of the of the chief rabbi. Same thing in the United Synagogue of the UK. The chief rabbi is the rabbi, and the local rabbis teach his doctrine, not their doctrine. According to Rav Moshe, the Gedolim determine what is a binding sociology, an obligatory ideological narrative, and the ethos of the community. You don't follow the, the letter of the law, because law no longer is the hefts of the canon, but the law is the gavra of the charismatic in person. The Godel's authority sounds like legal positivism. The law is the law is the law, and where the law stops, autonomy begins. In an imperfect world, in a perfect world, that works. But in the doff of the hat to Oliver Wendell Holmes and Ronald Dworkin and Lon Fuller, in a perfect, a perfect world requires flexibility. The Godel has the Yerat mind that renders him virtually infallible because Torah knowledge is not enough. You need the right attitude. And the right attitude is had only by the great rabbi and his charisma. The Godel is not subject to review because he possesses the literary culture mindset to read the mind of God. The problem is Devarim, Chapter 13, 1, 6 says otherwise. Orthodoxy requires the culture shell called Jewishness or Yiddishkeit be maintained. And that criteria will be applied to determine whether a, a law will be enforced or not enforced. Since the Godel has a learning, we must defer to his subjective intuition. And that subjective intuition is not up for challenge. Norma Joseph wrote her doctorate in McGill on Rabbi Feinstein's work, and she says, Rabbi Feinstein's work is expressed in his deep commitment to traditional categories of law, but was not isolated from the appreciation of contemporary norms, and marketplace, and education. Rabbi Feinstein's purpose was to ensure the survival of a particular group with a distinctive traditional lifestyle. I would add, he was not always traditional in application of law, but he was always consistent to his culture and his sense of responsibility. I come from a different place. I cannot dismiss this gentleman. His piety and learning and intelligence are intense. I would make certain different choices because I'm of a different world. I don't inhabit his space. 
But that doesn't mean you dismiss it. Ezehu Chacham, who's wise, Alomei Mikol Adam. And Rav Moshe is a man whom even if we dissent on certain issues, there is a great deal from which we can learn. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Comments or questions? Comments or questions? I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing. Rav Uter, yes. Can, uh, can you say a little bit about um, halacha kabatrai? Okay, halacha kabatrai means the law follows the last opinion, and batrai ends with Ravina and Ravashe. The notion that it, it continues afterwards doesn't work because the rule is a betin has to go to bechokma minyan to overturn. Halacha kabatrai does not mean any local rabbi after the Gemara, because we're not in the yeshiva. It's not in a Beit Din Hagadolin session. And who determines who is Batra anyway? By having a fixed law of the Gemara, the individual has a trump. I don't mean the president of the United States X. It's a trump card, says, that's the word that Ronald Dworkin uses, of control, so that the layman knows where he stands. We have a fixed text. Now you can, you can work around that, because the halacha of hara'at sha'ah allows us to suspend that in emergency, but only in an emergency. Halacha kabatrai cannot mean that a lesser individual rav living in the 21st century can override the Gemara. It means even Tosafot can't override the Gemara in theory, although Tosafot often does. Amazing, so helpful. Okay, uh, unfortunately we're out of time. I have so many more questions. This is so amazing, uh, but we're gonna put the recording out and have more chances to learn from Rav Yudur. So we're so grateful from this Holy Torah, Holy Torah from Yerushalayim, your Kodesh, wishing you continued so much bracha and hatzlacha. Thank you so much for this gift. Thank you so much, Rav.